You've made it to lesson four. Have you have you gone back and listened to all of them? Because it's really important to start with the first one. You wouldn't want to start a Bible study right in the middle. So I'm trying to lay a foundation here so you can understand what's coming. And so if you don't understand this foundation, then what's coming may be confusing to you. And you may think it's wrong. So the the foundation has to be laid so you can start to divide the word correctly. So, and I do know that um, a lot of times you'll hear me repeating things, repeating things, and the reason I do that is, um, number one, I'm old, and I do repeat, and uh, number two, though, there's a marketing strategy that says that you need to give a potential buyer uh, the spiel seven times before they will buy. So maybe that's what I'm doing here. Maybe I'm giving it to you seven times so, you, so you'll understand it. There's seven is a um, number of completion anyway. I mean, it's a divine number of completion. You know, God rested on the seventh day. It was completed. There are a lot of other ones too. But before we do our timeline, this is the lesson where we're going to do our timeline. And it's very important to go back over the Old Testament timeline. The Old Testament is so important. I mean, there's some teachers out there, one in particular that's very, very prominent, very famous, that really I think should know better, that says we don't even need the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament because the theme runs all the way through it, too. And sorry for my squeaky chair. I know you can hear my squeaky chair. It's very squeaky. So, sorry about that. Now, um, let, let's have a little pop quiz just real quick. See if you've been paying attention. Okay. Who is the Bible written for? Is it written for unsaved people to read it so they can get saved? Well, okay. There's a conditional yes to that answer. This is just conditional on one condition, that the Holy Spirit is leading this unsaved person to read it so they can get saved. But for the most part, the Bible is written for the redeemed, saved people. Let's read this scripture right here. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. For can he know them because they are spiritually discerned? So who's the natural man? He's the unsaved man. He's the natural man, the unsaved man. He cannot understand. Why can he not understand the Bible? because the Bible is spiritually discerned. We have a spirit that is alive when we're saved. That's the only way can, we can communicate with God in the spirit realm is with, through the Holy Spirit that is alive in our alive spirit. That's the only way. So that's the only way we can understand the Bible. There, you know, the, sometimes the reason people throw some of these scriptures out and say, oh, that's for the unsaved. They'll be reading along and, you know, and some, there's looks like there's a loss of something. There's a lot of that, especially in the book of Hebrews. But it's all through. Too. There's, Jesus talked about it, too, in, in, um, in, the, in the parables. So what we have a tendency to do is just throw that out because that's the unsaved. That's the, for the unsaved. Not true, not true. And, and we're gonna go through that in depth. Remember, gold, down there, gold is down there. Another event I wanna tell you about, we're not gonna go into it, but we're just gonna read a couple of scriptures about it. And then we're going to go into it in depth in a couple of lessons down. Um, so this is an event that's gonna happen after the rapture and before the probably during the tribulation period which we won't be going through we're pre pre-trib right well if you're not just stay with me stay with me because this message is for you too um so and before the before jesus um comes into his thousand year kingdom of heaven kingdom of god same thing 
Do you know what this event, this big event is? Let's read this scripture here. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So how many will appear? All. All who? Christians. That's who the Bible is written to. That's why I keep saying that. Who is Paul talking to here? He's talking to that Corinthian church, and they were pretty, they were steeped in sin, this church was. They were influenced by the the temple up on the the hill of Corinth that, I mean, there were terrible things going up, going on up there, pagan things. And actually they were influenced by that. So anyway, Paul, this scripture, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and to, that one may receive, that one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Again, all will appear, all Christians, and whether good or bad. Okay, as we said before, can Christians do bad things? You betcha they can. And, and as I said, sometimes we do bad things. Just because we're saved and we have the Holy Spirit within us, does that mean that automatically we're going to always do good things? We're always going to have good fruit. Always, because the Holy Spirit is there and He's going to do it in us. Is that automatic? No, it is not automatic. The Holy Spirit only works. It is our choice to let Him help us work. If we decide that we'd rather follow the world than, and Christians do this, follow the world than follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit... I mean, he's always there waiting for you to call him back up. But the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and he's not going to push his way forward and make you move your arms and, and do this and do that. No, no. That's why God gave us free will and gave us the choice. We have to choose righteousness. We have to choose to do right. We have to choose that. That's very important. So, okay, so here we go on our timeline. And um, so we're going to start putting more of this foundation together. So here we go on our historical Old Testament timeline. And why am I spending so much time on this Old Testament timeline? Well, it's very important because really the Old Testament was about God calling a people that he created, which were the Jews, to be faithful so they could rule with him. And this, this was the point all the way through the Old Testament, calling Israel over and over and over again and then rejecting him over and over and over again. And so really, the Old Testament really up to Acts is all about the Jews until finally the Jews were set aside and God started working, calling, I should say calling, another nation, which were the Gentiles and which was the new man in Christ, the church. So let's go over this Old Testament timeline and just keep that in mind that it's about ruling and it's about a kingdom from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. And so it's a kingdom of the heavens that God is calling an obedient people to rule with him. That's what this, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about from the very beginning to the very end. It's a kingdom rule. It's a kingdom that Adam and Eve were to rule. God's plan started with creating a people to rule in the Old Testament. As I said, it's the Jews to creating a nation of people to rule in the New Testament, the church. We see that the one nation, the Jews, lost their chance to rule in the heavens. They lost it. They were given chance after chance after chance, while another new nation or new nation in Christ, the church, is currently being offered 
this same kingdom, the kingdom of the heavens. And more specifically, we, at, we as Christians, as the new nation in Christ, are being offered a position of rulership in this kingdom of the heavens to rule with Jesus all throughout eternity during the thousand-year millennial reign, then through all out eternity. And it's on offer, but hear me here. It's not an automatic rule. It's not an automatic position, just as it was not automatic with the Jews. There, They had to obey, and they had to trust, and they had to believe what the Lord said. They were very influenced by idols from the nations around them, and so they had to qualify to rule, and as we have to qualify to rule with him. And what is the requirement? Again, what is the requirement? Faithful obedience to God. That's what it was. Faithful obedience. So now, remember, this is important. Remember, if you have been saved in the past, your spirit went from death to life. You've been saved at some point in the past. In a flash, you were saved. The Holy Spirit came in to reside in your spirit You've been put at that starting point to start working. Okay, I'll call it working. We're going to talk a lot about works in this whole Bible study and producing good fruit for this kingdom to come. We talked about what kingdom is in power right now, and that's Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of darkness right now. That's the only kingdom that is in operation right now. Of course, God is supreme ruler over all, but right now, Satan is, is being given his chance, his limited space of time, 6,000 years, to rule. So remember, we don't automatically get a position to rule with Jesus just because we've been saved. You have to produce good fruit here and go through a sanctification process here and now. This is our testing ground right here. God has put us here so we can learn about him, be obedient, and be trustful so he can trust us enough to rule in his kingdom to come. So it's really all about accountability now. It's about accountability now. And your final exam is coming. It's more, And it's more about that final exam that we'll talk about in the lessons to come about the judgment seat of Christ. The New Testament starts with the offer to the Jewish nation. There's that word again, nations, of this kingdom of the heavens by Jesus. This kingdom that is actually to come. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And really, it doesn't say repent for the kingdom of heaven is within you. That's a mistranslation. The, the word is really among you. Basically, Jesus was saying, I, your king, am here and I'm ready to give you the kingdom of heaven if you will repent as a nation so you can rule. That was, that was what he was saying. So the New Testament starts with an offer of the kingdom of the heavens and ends with the kingdom of this world. This is in Revelation eleven fifteen. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, the rightful king, Jesus Christ. So let's read that. Let me put eleven fifteen up. Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, so, there it is. There it is right there. That's the kingdom of the world, which, which is in operation right now, over to the kingdom of his Lord and, and his Christ, Jesus Christ. So that's the whole thing. That's the theme right there. That's the whole theme. There are two spheres or, two, or parts to this kingdom of the heavens, whether it's the kingdom of the darkness now or the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ to come in the thousand years uh, millennial kingdom. Now, in this present kingdom, 
there's an earthly sphere, there's an earthly part, and a heavenly sphere. So in other words, human counterparts on the earth right now are being ruled over by angelic counterparts in the heavens. And at the present, it, at the present time, it's Satan's fallen angels. And of course, God is, of course, the supreme ruler over all. And he's allowing Satan this limited time to be ruler now. There's a ruling hierarchy in God's kingdom as well as in Satan's kingdom. It's like an army. It's like a hierarchy that's in the army. So do you remember the scripture in Daniel where the Lord told Nebuchadnezzar, we talked about this, that the heavens rule? He was telling Nebuchadnezzar how things are run. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the uh, ruler of all. You know, he was the... Um, supreme ruler but actually he was not he lost his kingdom and so the heaven the heavens rule over human counterparts on the earth just like nebuchadnezzar had a kingdom he had a kingdom it was the babylonian kingdom and there were other kingdoms on the earth also here's an image of that statue that daniel saw in the dream in the dream and here are all the different empires you know so you can look at that babylonian Me media persia greek roman and then the end times so which is to come so so and also he, here's another scripture which is shows you the hierarchy that what goes on i love this story this is one of my favorite stories in the bible about Well, Daniel had seen a vision that had made him very, 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 it was a very disturbing dream, and he had been mourning for three weeks because of this dream. So let's read it. it let's read it in Daniel 10, 11 through 14, and this will show you the hierarchy. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, Understand the words I speak to you and stand straight, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking the word to me, I stood trembling. And then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So we see that um, Michael, actually, the in, in this kingdom of darkness, there's one exception to the rule with these fallen rulers. Michael, the fallen angels did not rule over Israel, did not rule over Israel. It was, it was only, these fallen angels only ruled over the nations. So we see that there was a prince of Greece in the heavens, which actually um, we know to be Alexander the Great on the earth. So there's an earthly counterpart to the heavenly ruling kingdom. The heavens rule over the earthly part. And this never changes and it never will. This is going on right now in their kingdoms of this world right now that are being ruled by the by the heavens, by Satan's fallen angels. Can't we see that? It's it's very it's a very, very evil world. And of course again the exception to the world to the rule in the Old Testament was Israel because it was ruled over by Michael. So now let's go to our timeline here. So I know I've had the timeline sitting up right here. So so what do we see? Eternity past. Do we know anything about eternity past? N not really. You know, we really don't. It could be, I mean, you read things about a pre-Adamic race. Maybe there was. Maybe that's what Satan, I mean, Lucifer at that time was ruling over. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Can you... Who knows? Maybe that was Atlantis. We don't know that. We don't know that. So, um, but we will. We'll know that one day, won't we? So let's start here 
where everything started at Genesis 1-1. So let's read this and we'll see, Just we'll try to do a flyover now. The Old Testament, you can't fly over too quickly because there's too much good stuff going on. So let's read Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's go on to 1-2. And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, if you'll look at Genesis 1-2, that word was without form. That's really a word that um, actually is a Hebrew word that means became. So, the, so actually what it says is the earth became without form. Now, what, what in the world made the earth come without form it was probably and most likely um, Lucifer fell within that time and he desecrated his um, area he was a messianic angel let's read about him let's let's read um, let's go to Isaiah 12 12 through 14 this is in the um, King James version how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. For we see here that Lucifer, we see here, I mean, this is what he wanted. He wanted to raise his throne. He had a throne. God had given him, he was a messianic angel. God had given him some area to rule, probably a huge, huge, which included the earth. So let's read another scripture about him in Ezekiel. Let's read this. This kind of tells where he was, what he looked like. Let's read it. It's Ezekiel 28, 13 through. Let's see how far does it go. Maybe it goes down to 19. Okay, let's read it. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper. Sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defile your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more. So let's, let's look at this scripture right here. This scripture indicates a lot of things. So let's look back at it. Okay, he was in Eden. He was in Eden. So we know he was there. Um, and of course, apparently he was very beautiful. And his kingdom, this was his kingdom. It was his. He was the cherub that covers. So he had a kingdom. He had an area that he covered, which he was he controlled which would indicate that he's a, a messianic ruling angel covering, you know, probably a very, who knows how large, large of an area, but we know it does include earth. It, include, it includes, still includes earth. And we see that he defiled his sanctuaries, so that could be between that 
Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, he defiled his sanctuaries by his trading. Well, you know, that's an interesting thing because, you know, a third of the angels fell with him. And, you know, I think with this trading, he may have said, you know, to these angels, well, if, if you will do this, if you will come with me, if you will follow me, then I will give you this. I will give you this. I will give you this part of the kingdom. I'll give you this part of the kingdom if you will follow me. This is I'll You just do this for me. I'll do this for you. Maybe that was the trading. And, and we see that God cast him out from the mountain of God. So really, what is that mountain of God? The mount, the holy mount of God. Well, it's where God was. And that's where God probably conducted his governmental activities. And of course, Satan was way up in that government. No telling how high he was up in in that government and so actually what god did he's cast him out of the mountain so he cast him out of god's governmental structure so he was cast out and he formed his own government which really is the total antithesis i guess you could say structured the same way that god's government is structured but it's all evil and and then the verse goes on to talk about his future demise, I think. And, and of course, that's by fire. So let's go on here. So, so we see that Lucifer falls. And the so he we know he rules from the heavens. That's what he does. He rules, he rules from the heavens. He, um, he, he always did. This is it. He always ruled from the heavens and he continues to rule from the heavens. So what happened next? We see that Adam and Eve, God created Adam and Eve to, and God recreated this earth. He create, recreated the earth in six days, rested on the seventh, created a man to rule with him. And, and Lucifer, knowing this, and this was his territory, knowing this was his territory, I'm sure he said to himself, I'm certainly not going to let this scrawny little man of God take over my territory. So actually we know what happened, don't we? Adam and Eve failed the one thing they were told to do and to not touch or eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we know what happened. We know what happened. And so, you know, when God came around, God, of course, saw what happened. And he asked Eve, you know, what happened? So when God came around, talked to Eve, saw that they were naked. Gosh, why were they naked? You know, here's one thing. They, they were probably covered in some sort of glory. And, and they probably had never... They never had lived without that glory covering. So what they had lost is that glory covering. They were they were naked. They were, and so at this point, God put. This is what God says about this, and this is Satan knew from what God said to him and to Eve at this point. Well, let's read it. It's Genesis three fifteen. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her, your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This bruising of the head and bruising of the heel indicates the, the beginning of this spiritual hostility developing between the woman's seed and which is Eve, of course, and her offspring with Satan and his offspring. Well, there's a lot going on about what his offspring could be, but we know that, that his spiritual offspring are all of his followers. You know, they're followers. And are these Christians that could be following Satan? Well, we won't go there, but they, it very well, Christians can follow another kingdom, the kingdom of the world. We know that. We know that Christians can do that. So so we see that through what Adam and Eve did, they were cast from the garden and they lost their purpose of ruling. What were they created for? They were created for one purpose, to rule. 
they were created to rule. So Lucifer, he's the default ruler, it was his kingdom, regains his kingdom and sets out on a mission to destroy God's people for the next 6,000 years because he knows that Eve will bring forth a seed. He, know, he knew this. That will be God's seed, Jesus Christ, that will destroy him. So Satan starts this evil plan right here. And it's an interesting scripture that brings up the first example of a very evil plan to destroy the seed of women. So let's read this. This is a very interesting thing right here that happened. And some people don't really understand what really happened here and it's really a huge thing there's just a small mention of it in the bible but but this is what happened let's read let's read here in genesis 6 1 now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of god saw the da daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves from all whom they chose. So these sons of God, they were angels, actually. And we know from, well, if you read anything, there are a lot of teachings about this particular thing that happened in Genesis 6. And they were watcher angels. They were evil. They planned this thing. They planned, these angels planned to come down to earth and create their own people and they were giants they when the people when the women of the earth produced the offspring they were called nephilim they were giants and the watchers uh, they were very evil they had a plan to destroy the genealogy of this man that was going to come that would bruise his head and so after this happened there was such wickedness on the earth, such wickedness. So we're, we're coming on down into here. And so we've got a next big thing that happened. It's Noah, because in this area, okay, there were giants. There were all sorts of wickedness going on. And God was said, I'm going to destroy all of that. So we know the story of Noah. Let's read some scripture here. Two, and Genesis 6, 5 through 6, 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah was the only man of his generation that had not been infected by this evil seed that had come down to infect all of man. And probably, probably most everybody on earth were infected. They were not of, of the pure bloodline that was going to lead to Jesus. So now here's the next thing. Here's the next thing that happened after Noah was the after after the flood, Noah and his three sons were replenished the earth again, but the earth was and again the earth was was evil. It was evil. And so let's read what happened next. And this is a big thing right here. This is big that only gets a little small mention here. But it's a big thing that happened here. So let's read it. It's Genesis 11 through, let's see, 11, 1 through, let's see how far that goes. It goes through 9. So let's read Genesis 11, 1 through 9. This is about Nimrod and his evil kingdom, Nimrod, the evil Nimrod. Now the earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, they had asphalt for mortar, 
And they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the of all the earth. So this is huge. So what did this create right here? What did this create? Nations. So nations, this is huge. This is a huge thing. So this, now we have nations that speak different languages. Were there some people in, individual people in these nations that maybe had, had heard the stories of Noah and the flood and Adam and Eve? Yes, of course. You know, they're, they're, always throughout time have been a smattering of, of faithful people that believed God. But for the most part, these nations were ruled by evil counterparts, these nations. So next, let's, let's stop right here so we won't get, this won't be too long. So here's our next line right here. So we're going to talk about what happened next, which is very important also.